Military sexual assault impacts both men and women in the military. Of the 19,300 estimated assaults in the year 2010, 10,700 victims were men, 8,600 were women. While rape, sexual assault, and sexual harassment are strongly associated with a wide range of mental health conditions for both men and women veterans, they are the leading causes of post-traumatic stress disorder among women veterans, while combat trauma is still the leading cause of PTSD among men. Professor Chitra Raghavan teaches psychology at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, City University of New York, where she pursues an interdisciplinary research agenda and explores how social risk factors impact with psychological factors in predicting violence. She has published in Violence Against Women, American Journal of Community Psychology, Journal of Traumatic Stress, and Journal of Interpersonal Violence. She says that while universally survivors of sexual assault face stress, depression, and other mental health issues, the context that this happens in the military sheds a different light on the situation. It's not a surprise because if you look at the civilian populations, one of the leading causes of post-traumatic stress disorder is sexual assault. And so I and many other um, researchers, therapists will work with victims who've had many different kinds of trauma, but when they ask them to identify you know, what's really been causing you distress among, let's say, various abuse, um, they'll pick the rape or the series of sexual assaults as the one that still affects them. And so it's not unusual, it's not new. Of course, the context of it being in the military puts a different light on it. Um, why, why might this be so? I mean, some of it is obviously the brutality of the attack, right? So some of why we develop trauma is um, what was the attack like? How did it, you know, what did it do to you? How did it feel? When did it happen? How much control did you have? Did you, you know, were you afraid? And how much of your integrity was violated? And a lot of the nature of these attacks are really brutal. They, they require, they have enormous physical force and capacitation. It's happening between someone that you trust or know, or at least might not know personally, but know because they're also in uniform. It's happening in a space that's supposed to be safe. I think that's an enormous violation of trust. By the end of 2011, rape within the U.S. military had become so widespread that it was estimated that a female soldier in Iraq was more likely to be attacked by a fellow soldier than killed by enemy fire. I think the process of not being able to talk about it, the process of reliving it in terrible fear, the fear that if they did talk about it, their female friends might not believe them. Let's not even go to male friends. Female friends might not believe them or may believe them and say, you need to just man up and be silent or may say you asked for it, blame the victim, you provoked it, or say, look, it's a fact of life. So invalidation in all these different ways, right? So fearing invalidation, possibly getting invalidated, being silent, but, and on top of that, frequently working with the rapist. So here's this person who's raped you brutally, violently, and then, the, then you have to continue doing work with him or under him, um, and you have to re-experience the rape in this horrible way, right? So I think, all of this you know, contributes to, to PTSD and suicidality. In 2012, the issue gained public attention after eight U.S. service members filed a lawsuit alleging they were raped, sexually assaulted, or harassed while serving in the military and were retaliated against once they reported the abuse. Um, pretty shocking harassment at 8th and I. Um, it culminated in a gang assault led by a senior officer in my command and his civilian friend. Um, they came to my house um, a block from base, um, threatened death, and proceeded to assault me. The lawsuit read, each defendant reportedly cites a policy of zero tolerance and systematic reform regarding rape and sexual assault. Yet this rhetoric has failed to change the misogynistic culture of the army and has not resulted in any meaningful reform or reduction in sexual assaults. But according to my guests, the issue may go beyond the misogynistic culture of the army. 
I think it is misogynistic, obviously, because it's a traditionally male culture, and so women have not had a formal place for a long time. But it's more than misogynistic, it's also an imperialist culture. It's set up as a structure that is both meant to protect the U.S., but also invade. It is set up as a machine that is unquestioning with hierarchies, and so because of that, because you don't question and you have hierarchies, you also have lots and lots of black holes. You have doors that don't need to open. You have people that don't need to be questioned. There's also a culture of bullying, of intimidation, of obedience, of submission. And so it's, it's I think, much more than misogyny. It's all of these things with misogyny overlaid or perhaps woven through. And the thing, and we obviously need reform, the thing that makes reform so difficult is the closed doorness of it. All of these are sort of knots that are interlaced, but every knot is knotted together, and it's, all, it's impossible to find which one to unravel to get in. In a debate that has focused largely on women, this fact is often overlooked. The majority of service members who are sexually assaulted each year are men. In its report on sexual assault, the Pentagon estimated that 26,000 service members experienced unwanted sexual contact in 2012, up from 19,000 in 2010. Of those cases, the Pentagon says 53% involved attacks on men, mostly by other men. Though women, who represent about 15% of the force, are significantly more likely to be sexually assaulted in the military than men, experts say assaults against men have been vastly underreported. After four combat tours, Sergeant Micah Turner realized that the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were not for the causes that had been stated. So when returning from his post-deployment leave from his fourth tour, he went AWOL from the U.S. Army and started speaking out against the war. I was in Afghanistan in uh, 2010, um, and that was the year that bin Laden was killed. Uh, we were sitting in the Ford operating base kind of waiting for the news from the president. And um, I was getting excited because I thought that, you know, that that was the end, that we were about to go home. But um, that, that was not the end. And um, it wasn't much later at the NATO conference that um, President Obama dedicated American forces to Afghanistan and Iraq for 15 years. This idea that, that we're not going to be there for um, a little bit longer, that, that we're going to be PCSing there, that we're going to be raising our children <laughs> and uh, we're going to be gone for years at a time. Um, I kind of felt betrayed. You know, I kind of felt like, like everything that I served for was a lie. It had nothing to do with 9-11 or our fight for freedom or justice, spreading democracy. Those was all just propaganda. You know, we were, were really there because uh, some people profit off of war, and those people want to keep profiting. And that's the end. Wow. And so you decided to go in? Right. I, um, they wanted to redeploy you. No, no. I, I was done. I was done with my deployments. So, you know, I was going to have a cushy job as an E6, but I knew that if I waited it out that extra year um, and I came back and, and started speaking out against the wars, that no one would, no one would care because I'm just a, just a veteran. And of course you left the Army. Veterans leave the Army because they don't like the Army. So I, I felt like it was necessary to take the risk to face the jail time so that, so that I might be heard. Today, he focuses on his activism and art, and despite the many challenges he faced in the military, including harassment, he says not all is lost, and his time there made him the person he is today. I did five and a half years in the Army, uh, four combat tours, three in Afghanistan, one in Iraq, and um, to ask me kind of generally about my military time is hard because in a lot of ways it made me the artist that I am and the, the man that I am. It taught me, you know, self-reliance and it taught me how to plan and organize and all the things that I use every day to, to be a successful person in the civilian world I learned in the military. But it, it's kind of a catch because I also uh, was in war and um, had to deal with a lot of adversity that came from being queer in the military, both before Don't Ask, Don't Tell and afterward. If you are feminine, whether you're a female or not, you are targeted in the military because there's only 15%, 15% women. Uh, who knows how the numbers work out when you add in the queer community. But if you are in any way different, you're going to be targeted in the military so just because that's kind of the nature of a, a stressful environment. They try and create that and that means um, 
targeting people for their weaknesses, what, what are considered weaknesses in the society. Micah says telling the story about male victims is the key to changing the culture of the military. It's actually pretty alarming. Um, according to the statistics that the Army gave me uh, during their SHARP program, their sexual harassment and Army prevention program, they said that over 75% of enlisted women had reported sexual assault. That means that even if 8% aren't reporting that over 80% of the women, four out of five, are being sexually assaulted. And it's, it's because of a culture, I believe, in the military that's fundamentally different than that in the civilian world. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about that culture? Yeah, it's, it's a culture that sees emotion as weakness. It sees anything that has to do with, with um, being vulnerable, being weak, as a problem that you need to somehow rid yourself of that and be cold, stoned, some kind of like a robot or something. But it's just not the way that, that reality operates. Everyone is, is weak sometimes. Everyone has imperfections and, and uh, you have to embrace that if you're going to heal from when you've been damaged like so many soldiers have. I think it's that fundamental problem that's the reason for our high suicide rate. 17 veteran suicides a day. That's, a, that's an unbeatable statistic. Abuse and harassment and rape are really about bullying, domination, and intimidation. And so is the military. Right? You, it's, you know, when you take, when you decide to, the way you control, the way you get people to behave in a way that's unnatural, um, behave to give up free will, to obey, to accept whatever that's told to you, you're accepting, um, you're accepting something that's against human nature. And this is done through bullying and intimidation and coercion and punishment and then reward because you agree. So you're asking then people to say, to then sort of take sexual assault aside and say, but this is wrong when in fact the, the whole culture is into bullying and intimidation and assault is a symptom of that. So I think that's part of why you know, victims are blamed. It's, it's not sort of an individual threat, it's part of a larger problem a very real threat that, that even if you get one person of a group of people um, that are harassing you, that there are still other people that would give it to you worse once they had been punished. Um, but even then, it's, it's if they'll be punished. Um, in, in my personal experience, I was told to toughen up to, uh, you know, that they're just joking, you know, to not take it personally when they call you faggot, when they call you queer. And, um, and I really don't appreciate that because I don't feel like most places in the, in the world would tolerate that sort of behavior. Um, but it's kind of accepted in the military that, uh, that men, uh, men say these things and that men are tough on each other and it's just part of, of being tough. And, and I feel like that's a lot of where the, the anxiety and fear comes from, from people that aren't the, the stereotypical male, um, even though they're perfectly capable soldiers. They, they have just as much of a right to fight or serve the country as anyone else. And um, it's harder for them because they're targeted by the, the alpha male. Micah tells me transitioning to the civilian world is never easy. And coupled with the invisible wounds of harassment, it becomes harder than one can imagine. And while rather than join the infantry, he worked in the psychological operations making what he calls propaganda leaflets, he battled another war within himself. Transitioning into the civilian world is never easy. It's not easy for anyone. Um, you go from one pace of life to one, one tract of life to having all the freedoms in the world, but um, an unsure footing, and that happens to everyone when they get out. So I've, have, I've had a lot of um, issues just like everyone, but I don't have a lot of the, the pain that my friends have from a lot of the combat that they went through because a lot of the times I wasn't in the line of fire. Um, as they were. So our, our struggles are different. Um, I dealt with a lot of harassment, but they dealt with dying on a daily basis. That's kind of a different pitch level of stress. Um, so I don't claim to have PTSD, but um, there's definitely some fundamental wrongs in the Army. And what about help from the Veteran Affairs Office? All I can really say about the VA is, in my, my minimal experience with them, is that um, they, they're insufficient to, to try and take care of the problem that the veterans are facing. They're just, they're not enough, they don't operate quickly, they don't operate uh, in a way that can really offer soldiers a true aid, a true help. The, the kind of mental wellness that they need is something they can't find at the VA. It takes 
months of red tape to get anything done, and by that time, you might have just suck-started a pistol to your face. Again, I feel like in a lot of ways it comes back to a culture of, um, of believing that you're not allowed to be weak, that you're not allowed to be um, flawed, that you're not allowed to be anything but perfect, anything but machine, metal, steel. Um, and if you just hold all those emotions in for too long, eventually you snap. The Pentagon found that last year, out of an estimated 26,000 sexual assaults, only a disturbing 3,300 were reported, and out of those, only 302 were prosecuted. Now, for the first time in decades, senators drafted the defense bill to include sweeping changes to the Uniform Code of Military Justice that would greatly impact the way sexual assaults are handled in the military. The Defense Reauthorization Bill contains improvements to the current military justice system. However, two senators, Gillibrand and McCaskill, have offered opposing solutions to this problem. Gillibrand's proposal would take the power to prosecute away from commanders, while McCaskill's solution would include the commanders but with a better system of reviews. While Gillibrand currently has 50 votes on her side, the proposal isn't being backed by the Pentagon. Gillibrand's rationale is that under the current system, commanders have absolute authority to accept or reject a recommendation to prosecute, and there is no appeal. Commanders can also overturn a guilty verdict without any explanation or reason. Because commanders are often biased, this system leaves thousands of cases unprosecuted, and the testimony of victims have shown that they have been abused twice, first by the assault and then by the system meant to help them. A commander's main interest um, in considering sexual harassment cases is of his soldiers, both the victim and the victimizer. The, the person that's uh, being prosecuted in this case is also a soldier of, of these commanders in, in some cases. And it, uh, you, you wonder if they always have the soldier's best interest in mind, if they're going to try and save them from a punishment that they really deserve. There have been a lot of negative response to Gillibrand's proposal. The chairman of the Armed Services Committee, Senator Carl Levine, a Democrat from Michigan, urged rejection of Gillibrand's approach. He stated that the key to combating sexual assault in the military is allowing commanders to court-martial troops for the crime. Gillibrand's amendment, quote, removes a powerful tool from those responsible for dealing with the problem. Senator McCaskill also encourages an amendment in which commanders still have a say in the matter. Senator McCaskill's solution would allow commanders to determine the cases that get prosecuted but prevent them from overturning convictions and add more layers of review for their actions. It also would eliminate the good soldier's defense, which could be used to mitigate punishment for troops who perform well on their job. However, commanders have final authority. If the judge advocate general and a commander agree to prosecute, there's no review needed. The matter simply goes to court-martial. As for the American public, well, they appear to agree with Gillibrand. A Washington Post-ABC News poll released last week found that nearly 6 in 10 Americans believe that decisions on whether to prosecute allegations of sexual assault in the U.S. military should be made by an independent group of military prosecutors instead of within the military chain of command. As for the defense bill, it is hoped that a compromise will be reached before the end of the year. While some military officials see the increase of reported complaints in positive terms saying it showed an increased willingness among victims of assault to come forward, the numbers are also the latest in a series of developments underscoring the problem of sexual assault in the military, which has vexed Pentagon officials and drawing fire. For now at least.